Gigabyte's X299 motherboard lineup features a range of options with support for Intel's Core X series CPUs. Boards like the Aorus X299 Gaming 7 are packed with useful features and support Optane memory, Thunderbolt 3, and USB 3.1 Gen 2. Click the link in the description for more information. Excellent! Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Paul's Hardware. I am super excited about this video. I'm super excited for today because I have a day of building and I have a ton of hardware here in front of me, so much so that I was like barely able to even keep it all just in this one shot so I can start this video out video out, but this is Arctic Panther. This is the resurrection, the rebuild of Arctic Panther with modern hardware, and I'm gonna be water cooling it, and this is gonna be the part one video. Uh, no, no two ways about it. This is definitely gonna take more than just a single video to cover. So I'm gonna start with initial installation, uh, start getting the water cooling stuff set up. I need to start out by saying a huge thank you to uh, Asus as well as EK, EK Waterblocks for sponsoring a lot of the parts for this build. Uh, and I've already done enough teasing about this entire project. So I'm gonna get right to it and start off by going over as quickly as I can all the parts that I'm going to be attempting to install in my custom modded Define R5. So the Define R5 from Fractal is the standard ATX case that I'm going to be housing everything in. And again, this has been custom modded starting out when I first did this initial build in this case a couple years back. I did a uh, tempered glass side panel window before that was cool. Uh, I, I also just recently have added a USB Type-C plug to the top for USB uh, 3.1 Gen 2 connectivity, 10, 10 gigabits per second, and that's pretty sweet. So keeping that case modern and up to date. Uh, all right, so for the core of my system and probably gonna cause the most controversy is this i7-7820X CPU. Uh, there's plenty of arguments to be made as to why I should or should not use this processor, but for my purposes, uh, I have two of these right now, which means I can install one into this system and then I'll still have another one to use for further testing because it's nice to have a floater one that I can pop into another test bed or something like that. So that's actually a big reason why I'm going with this right now. Also, I did some testing uh, just to see with dual GTX 1080 Ti's what the best solution would be for getting the most bang for uh, the, the most performance out of them. And the Intel platform does still seem to be the case right now. Granted, yes, there's more testing to be done and all that stuff. I'm not ruling out swapping this CPU out at some point in the future, but for now, that's what I'm going with. It's got uh, eight cores, 16 threads, and it is somewhat limited on PCIe lanes as well. So my uh, 1080 Ti's are gonna be running it by 16 and by eight. So we'll hopefully do some testing with that and see how things play out. But this is gonna let me get the system up and running for now, and feel free to argue in the comments about whether or not this is an actual good decision. Uh, and then I'll also say for anyone who's like, oh, you should totally be doing this on Threadripper. Guys, I do have a Threadripper water-cooled system planned coming soon, so uh, I haven't named that one yet though, so I can't tell you exactly what that is. The motherboard though is the ROG Strix X299-E Gaming. Chose this one because it's a very nice clean looking motherboard. It doesn't have quite the full black and white aesthetic like I had with the original X99 Deluxe board that I used in Arctic Panther, but it does have a nice subtle, somewhat subtle set of RGB features on it that I can turn on and off and can control. Uh, the RGB is going to match up and work with the Asus Aura software. So that's another key aspect of this. This is gonna be a black and white build, but my plan is to be able to engage RGB mode when I want to. Um, and, and of course, as always, keep things classy. So uh, for memory, I got the G-Skill Trident Z kits, uh, the standby, it's kind of been the initial foray into RGB memory and it works really well and it looks really cool and it's uh, sort of black, white, and gray otherwise, so it's still gonna match with everything else. While I'm down here, might as well point out my storage. For now, I'm just installing this for storage, a one terabyte OCZ uh, Toshiba NVMe RD400 SSD. One terabyte should be plenty for uh, games and storage and and if I need another uh, SSD, I'll probably pop one in there, but for now, that's what we're going with. The power supply is another carryover from the original build, and this one, uh, you can't really see it very well right now, but it is custom sleeved. I did the sleeving on this myself. I invested hours and hours and hours of work into it. It's 80 plus platinum, 1000 watt uh, fractal design Newton power supply, which is perfectly adequate and gets everything done, so I have no reason to swap this out with anything else. Also, it's got that nice imprint of the snowflake on the top, which, which I think looks pretty cool. For GPUs, I have two Asus GTX 1080 Ti's. Uh, and these are the Strix version. They're overclocked out of the box. I'm gonna overclock them more, of course, once I get them water-cooled. And uh, NVIDIA has said they're not launching anything beyond the 1080 Ti this year. So 
uh, for the remainder of 2017. This is the top dog when it comes to uh, at least practical consumer graphics cards if you don't want to spend well over $1,000 for a Titan X little P. Uh, still gives you 11 gigs of memory, uh, GDDR5X memory per card. Uh, these are really nice cards. They're, they're quiet running. They have custom PCBs designed by Asus and therefore we need specialized water blocks. So those are under here, the EK FC 1080 GTX Ti Strix. So these are made specifically for the PCB design of these Strix graphics cards. I uh, should be able to get those installed today. I also have back plates for those, which I, uh, I ordered because the EK website tells you those are required. But I'm still very strongly considering just sticking with uh, what it's got on there, which allows me to, to have that RGB ROG logo on the back, which I think looks pretty cool. And I don't mind this back plate for the Strix at all, so uh, we'll see how things play out today, and maybe I'll just leave that on there. Uh, and, and and pass on the EK ones for now. But speaking of EK stuff, that's kind of the majority of the rest of the things I have here, barring a, a Primo Chill product right there. But um, starting with the monoblock, uh, really excited about this one, the Asus Strix X299-E monoblock. Again, I, it's designed specifically for this motherboard uh, in order to provide cooling for the CPU and also the power delivery up top there. And keeping the power delivery cool on X299, uh, is a bit of a challenge depending on what motherboard manufacturer you speak to, so I'm glad to be water cooling that. I've got an EK X Res uh, 100 DDC pump, and I have a pump uh, reservoir extension for this to make it taller, take up a little bit more space, hopefully look pretty cool. Uh, and then I've got EK Vardar Evo fans, a total of six of those, so I'm hopefully going to be doing three in the top, two in the front, one in the bottom down there. May or may not add one more for exhaust in the back, we'll see if I, I have room. I didn't in the original build. Uh, for radiators, I actually have a thicker one and a thinner one. I've got the Slim Edition and the Performance Edition here. 360 Performance Edition, 240 Slim Edition. Should give me a little bit of extra room in there. And um, yeah, again, I'm just going to kind of play around with that and see what we're doing as far as space once those are actually installed. For hardline tubing, because this is a hardline water cool build, this is PETG tubing, so I will be doing some bending with this later on. That will probably come in a second video by the time I get to that, but um, we'll see how things go today. This is PETG, and this is 12 millimeter inner diam diameter and 60 millimeter outer diameter. So this is the thicker style of tubing like I used in Hotbox, my wife's build that I did last year. Um, so I think it looks pretty cool. I kind of like the thicker tubing, you know, I mean, it just gets the job done. So. Uh, I've, got, I've actually got tons of these, and I like that EK uh, wraps them up individually so that the tubing doesn't get scratched in transit. Now there's actually more water cooling stuff besides what I have here, um, so I'll be sort of bringing that out over time. I have a bunch of fittings and everything. I have the uh, hardline tubing compression fittings. Uh, and then I got a few extra products here, like uh, this one I ordered from Primo Chill, which is a Vortex visual flow indicator. I like the flow indicator, so I'm going to see if I can pop that in there and get that to work. Uh, and then I got a few other extra pieces of gear that I'm going to be given a shot at using here. So this is an XSPC cutter that's specifically made for PETG tubing. So maybe that'll make the tubing cutting a little bit easier too. But I'll sort of uh, mention this, these things as I go along. For now, uh, let's, let's get to building. Uh, I'm ready. I'm ready to build. Let's go.
step one with any build should be an outside of the box test. I have skipped that a lot in, in a lot of my recent builds, but when I'm planning to water cool something, it's not something that you can pass up. So I've set everything up out here. I'm actually using my stock heatsink fan for uh, LGA 2011 and 2011-3, so that's kind of nice. And uh, let's give her the old college try and see how things work. Uh, this motherboard doesn't have a on-off switch. That's okay. Hey, there it is. All right, new CPU installed. Also, yes, this is the 7820X. That that was, I was pretty sure. I do have, I, I do have an engineering sample 7900X too, but um, yeah, this is the right one. So cool, not a full test, but uh, we got the basics to go in here. So I think we're good to go and move on with the water cooling stuff. So part of the attempt to use the existing ASUS backplates is securing them on there properly, which I can do for the most part. The central screws uh, that, that hold, the, um, hold it on over the GPU and over the MOSFETs, that still works. It's still functional, so those still tighten through the back here. Uh, the main issue is there's, there's screw holes that hold this backplate on, which are accessible from this side which are blocked by the block once it's on there. And also, I seem very limited on the number of screws I have that actually uh, work for that. Uh, most of the screws that came out of it are fairly long, they're, they're a little bit lengthier, so if I try to screw that just straight through uh, the board, even if I use a little washer, it sticks out the back and doesn't look very good. Um, so I am going to try to shorten some of these and just, just trim the end off. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. I have, I'm not sure if I have high hopes or not. This is making me really think that I should get a vice. <laughs> yeah, the whole screw just popped off and not the right tools or the right method to do something like this. Nope. <laughs> it's probably a bad idea. I'm doing a terrible job. <laughs> hey. If you I'll take him over this.
All right, guys, so I kind of promised you that this was gonna be a part one video, and I think we've reached a point right now where I'm gonna cut it off and say this is the end of part one. Uh, we've faced some challenges, we've overcome some obstacles. Uh, the first, of course, was just to get the system set up and do a test boot. If you're setting up a water-cooled system, I highly, highly recommend you do that because you do not wanna get all the stuff in there, especially if you're doing a hard line and then suddenly find out that your motherboard's bad or something like that. So fortunately we had a good test boot. That went pretty well. Beyond that, it was mainly installing these blocks. So the mono block went in fairly easily. For installing the mono block, we actually had to poke through the motherboard and, and install it with screws on the back. And that's the first time I've done this on a high-end desktop motherboard. I actually discovered that there's just a basically a sheet of plastic there that you poke through and then that allows you to get through and mount from the back. Um, but that installed pretty easily beyond that. Uh, all the hardware, of course, was included in the EK kit that came with it. Then installing the blocks on the graphics cards. And here's where I was doing my best to see if I could maintain and keep these back plates that came with the Asus Strix GTX 1080 Ti's because they have a nice brush metal finish and they also have an RGB logo on there, um, which I feel like losing that since it's kind of one of those little features that comes with the graphics card was something I was gonna see if I could do without. Now the biggest dilemma there is that you have some screws that are supposed to screw into the back plate from this side of the card. You have other screws that are supposed to screw into the block from this side of the card. And when you use the back plate that doesn't come with the EK water block, you don't have access to all of those screw points. Fortunately, I had a very, very tiny uh, actual screwdriver bit and that was able to fit through the tiny hole and screw in the screws, even while screwing down through the uh, back plate that came with the 1080 Ti. So right now that's installed. Uh, I am probably gonna keep it as is, but let me know in the comments what you guys think. It's not a completely clean installation. If you look at it directly from the side, you can see a few parts where uh, the back plate doesn't necessarily sit as flush or as straight as it could, but I think it's fairly not noticeable. Uh, so if you guys have any feedback for me on that, what, what you think I should do, please go ahead and leave that in the comment section down below. The next steps are gonna be, of course, getting the radiators installed in the front and in the top, uh, getting the uh, pump and reservoir installed and mounted to the front as well. I need to get the radiators first because the pump is actually going to install on a bracket that mounts to that. I can then actually start installing my fittings in various places. Like, like I could probably screw this one in right now. I'm getting distracted though. Uh, and then of course, getting the tubing installed, bending it, uh, getting the loop figured out. I'm also gonna figure out where I'm gonna put my, my fill port and my drain ports. So all that is coming very soon. I know I'm not as far as long as I could be. So I hope you guys have liked this part one video. Hit the thumbs up button if you did enjoy it and stay tuned for part two coming out very soon. Arctic Panther is on the way. See you guys next time.